Captain Floyd.
great white father, James C. Floyd.
was not my success. I carried out before and after many flights more difficult, dangerous, and demanding. It was a successful, it was a successful and more visible step in development of the aircraft created by the thousands dedicated, enthusiastic, and hard-working men and women. They were proud of this aircraft, and that's why later the sudden cancellation of the Arrow was such a shock to many. For many. It was my privilege to work with, to work with many outstanding people like Jim Floyd, the chief designer of the Arrow, Mario Fasando, excellent boss of the experimental writer's section, and of course, my friends, test pilots, Don Rogers, I think he is somewhere here.
who is president of the Arrow 2000 project going on in, uh, in Calgary. And then there's another one uh, to all employees of Agro Canada again, to, to Jim Floyd. Congratulations on the 40th anniversary of the first flight of Arrow 201. It was a significant achievement in 1958 and would be deemed the same today. Thank you for your efforts and the inspiration to achieve greatness that you have left for future generations of Canadians. And it's signed the Alberta Four. Cap Bailey, who is from the Hall of Fame. Alan Jackson, who built that wonderful full-scale replica. And Doug and Donette Hislip, who built all the flying models for the, for the film. Oh, I'd like to read the, uh, those two telegrams that came this morning.
and for Crawford to uh, even pretend that he was going to do that, he would have been marched off to jail in, in double quick time. Um, the, the sad, to me anyway, and uh, frightening thing really, is that these were the strange characters that were advising Mr. Diefenberg uh, on the merits of the arrow at the time of the cancellation. No wonder he was misled, no wonder he was confused. I, th I, I don't like to say this, but uh, it, it, it wouldn't, I suppose really, uh, I don't want to believe that uh, many of the cabinet ministers in Mr. D. Baker's cabinet were either brain dead <laughs> or did not understand, they had no understanding whatsoever of what the Arrow program was all about.
so much to that powerful uh, subject. I realized that uh, of all of the real names that were given to these fictional people in the film, about the only ones remaining are Jan Zorotowski and myself, um, Sir Roy Dobson, Wilf Curtis, and Marshall Curtis, Crawford Gordon, Fred Smythe, Jack Woodman, Jim Chamberlain, and in the political arena, C.B. Howe, John Nathan Baker, George Hees, and a number of the other politicians have all put on the Gusman and Wellington on the way from us. The female Arrow project engineer didn't need to fly away because she never existed. <laughs>
guided the arrow through some very, very difficult times than did what we see with it there. And I still think that. I think it was an insult. Um, in the many discussions that I had with Mary Leckie and Keith Leckie before the CBC2 company project, uh, I think I drove them almost crazy by my insistence that those real names be taken out. And on the last meeting I had with them, I got a letter from Keith Leckie, and uh, I'll just read a couple of passages. And he said, I have conferred with Mary and Paul, who was the other producer. We have decided that you are right. We cannot use the real names for most of the characters and we'll fictionalize them. So a very long letter, but I'll read this a bit. We very much respect your position as the guardian of the truth and the facts about the arrow. If we use fictitious names, present it as a fictional story on the arrow, or make accurate the information that draw at the end, we hope, we hope to ease your concerns somewhat. I strongly hope you can find a way to forgive my dramatic meddling with the facts and accept the spirit of truth with which I have tried to tell a wonderful story. And I, I, I really think it is a wonderful story. Um, but it, it isn't accurate. It is not by any means accurate. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I, I really enjoy that film, and I was one who stood up at the preview and, and clapped it for about 15 minutes. It, 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 I was to totally taken with the film. Uh, the general presentation was excellent. The, some of the, of, the, uh, of the acting was very, very good. The flying shots, I thought, were superb. They were completely out of this world due to a very dedicated team of model makers and controllers and uh, computer animators, which were all put, later put together. Um, as you know, the film got a number of Gemini Awards, and one of the awards that I was delighted to see was for the special effects, because uh, they did such a wonderful job. And the day after the uh, awards, I had a brunch with Doug Isler. Uh, Doug was the guy in charge of the real contribution to the true story of Avron and the Arrow was incidental. It is a fantasy. Any film that leaves out any mention of company test pilot Spud Pataki has to be non-history. It's got to be fictional. Spud was, as Jack says, was the only pilot that flew all five aircraft. He was the only, well, he flew many more hours than any other pilot. He flew faster than any other pilot, and he was the last pilot to fly the arrow. But there's no mention of him in the film whatsoever. Not even in the film or the role at the end. And I think it has to be on that basis classed as, as fiction. The same goes for uh, Chief of Flight Operations, Don Rogers, and the Chief Engineer on the Arrow, Bob Lindley. The omission of any mention of those people and other people who may have made a tremendous contribution to the Arrow puts it in the category of a fiction. I can also promise you that aircraft designers do not uh, get their inspirations from paper darts, <laughs> coke bottles put in a wind tunnel, and saw cuts in the model wing of an airplane with a hobby saw. That is, that is not the way you design. But you knew that, didn't you? You knew that. So why do you keep coming back and asking me? Was this the right or not? The next question, and I'll, I'll try and, I, I know I'm taking too much.
much time. But do you think your part was played well? Well, if uh, one thing is, if I dare to, in this mixed company, to say what some of my colleagues said about that one, uh, I'd be shot out of this room in, in, in a minute. And one of them uh, phoned me from the, from the West and he said, you should sue the CBC for uh, a really diminishment of role and character. Uh, I thought that was a nice turn of phrase. But on the other hand, they, they'd uh, done the same thing with Yan and with Fred Smyre and so many other people that, uh, well, it's not enough time to do things like that. And I've no money for roles anyway. Uh, but I thought it was a nice turn of phrase. I simply told my young uh, correspondent that if I would be as laid back and useless as the James Floyd in the film, there is no way that I would have survived for so many years as head of that incredibly talented and professional group of engineers. They were the tops. I wouldn't have lasted 13 minutes, never mind 13 years. And uh, so this is what I told them. You've, you've probably seen the actor who took me uh, on, the, on the box. And, uh, yeah, that's right. He, he, uh, he sells oatmeal on the... On the uh, <laughs> I think he should have let, been left with his gold of porridge. <laughs> Still out there. I had to tell him that unfortunately, except for the bits and pieces in the National Aviation Museum, that all the arrows went to the great recycling emporium and probably finished up with garbage cans, toasters, and frying pans. And uh, obviously a great shame. Uh, but it was nice to pretend that one got away, even in the fairy tale. The next question was, was Crawford Gold a drunk and womanizer that he was played in the movie? Uh, what do I answer that? <laughs> I have to say that of all the characters in the movie, the one that was nearest to life was Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> As Crawford Gold. And in fact, when, when I think about Crawford now, Dan Aykroyd's face pops up. <laughs>
should be proud of them, and I think we should tell them that we're proud of them. As for what we were doing uh, all those years ago, 40 years ago, it's always a good excuse to have an event like this and get together with old friends and uh, swap yarns and things like that. And I, I'm delighted to be here tonight. Uh, in fact, uh, to put it bluntly, and in the words of George Burns, at my age I'm delighted to be anyway. <laughs>
Lancaster subcontractors and equipment manufacturers reviewing and writing up their processes. In some instances, I would take an air, air ministry photographer with me to photograph all the details. I returned to Canada in time to see the first 430 Lancaster aircraft getting ready to roll off the assembly line at Mall. Despite the hustle and the bustle of wartime production, the eight-year-old plant in Chatterton was still steeped in tradition. And one of the traditions was four o'clock tea served in the executive dining room. Walter Duncan and I were treated as executives, so we partook of afternoon tea. It was the equivalent of the coffee break, except they also served the cheese, cookies, and or buns. The cheese was particularly welcome as our diet was short of proteins. During these uh, tea breaks, Sir Roy Dobson would occasionally stop and talk to me and ask how the Canadian program was getting along. I usually took the opportunity to tell him what a great country Canada was, and if he were smart, he would look into building an aircraft industry in Canada after the war. Whether the seeds fell on fertile soil, I don't know. But Sir Roy visited the Malta plant during the war, which had then become Victory Aircraft, and was impressed with the quality of the work and the enthusiasm and the capability of the people. When the war ended, the government closed down the Lancaster and Lincoln programs, and but directed that the termination of people should proceed slowly. By December of 1945, 7,000 people at Malkin was down to 300. It was at that point that C.D. Howe, then appropriately called Minister of Everything, and anxious to utilize the Malton plant, arranged with Sir Roy Dobson to take over the plant on very easy terms. I worked tirelessly to get the deal negotiated. The terms were that the company would pay rent only if and when it started to make a profit. The company was formed in December 1945 with Fred Smythe as its first employee, and with the 300 Victory Aircraft employees transferred to the new company. I was one of the 300. Soon, he men would be coming over from the eight-year-old plant in Chatterton to form the nucleus of the Canadian operation and to plan its future. And I'm happy to add that some of those who are with us tonight. What was it like working at Aldor Grant? Recently, I took a step backward in time and felt the heartbeat of Aldor. I came across 66 copies of the Aldor News, essentially a time capsule which unlocked part of the heartbeat and part of the secret behind the Aldor spirit. I was impressed by the tremendous enthusiasm of the people at Avro as reflected in the publication, and by the many activities over and above the company's decision, design and manufacturing operations. In 1953, the publication itself was judged to have been the second best employee publication in Canada and the US. There were approximately 650 publications entered that year. It indicated that Avro had the talent, the energy, the people, and the will to do a great job in whatever it tackled. The company was anxious to look after its people and it sponsored and promoted many different activities. Hockey games between Avro and Arenda were sell out events. The main game was preceded by a peewee event demonstrating that the company's desire to get the youngsters involved. And many prizes were given up during the event, including a new car for some lucky worker. A crowd of 12,000 at the games indicates the company's spirit at that time. How many companies are there that could take over Maple Leaf Gardens for a company hockey? There were men's and women's basketball teams, hockey teams, one of which went on to an Ontario championship, 
soccer and golf clubs, a gliding club, men's and women's baseball teams, bowling teams, dart teams, an amateur radio club, and the company even had a pipe band. There were a number of events during the year in which special plans were made for the children. The company's annual picnic was held at the CNE and drew up just above everybody. And every child received a prize. And the Christmas party at the Coliseum was another big event where no child went home without a Christmas present. These events were always well documented by an excellent photographic department. Many of the photographs were taken by staff photographer Ben Morse, one of the finest photographers produced by this country. And here I must add that Vern Morse and his wife Gloria had made a special trip from Florida just to be with us tonight. And so each issue of the Avro News, with its many pictures of company personnel and their children, helped cement the bond between the company and its workers. Both the manufacturing techniques we used and the products we turned out were state of the art. As a result, we were receiving world attention for our efforts, and many were noting our achievements. I know that some of the men who tore themselves apart to get the job done during the Arrow days were scarred emotionally when the government canceled the program and destroyed the aircraft, and I believe they will probably carry those emotional scars for the rest of their lives. But my son Brian tells me that in his work, he's continually running into people whose fathers worked at Avro, and they share a sense of pride in their father's contributions during those magical years that belonged to Avro. And so it seems that the spirit created during those momentous 50s is a lasting legacy whose torch we thought was extinguished but in fact, burns brightly still. During the 14 years of the company's existence, we carried out some astonishing achievements. I think that perhaps only once in a lifetime, one works on a dream that becomes a part of the fiber of one's life. When many people work on a dream, each of their contributions and their memories and their families Each and every person in this room, former employee, wife, child, or grandchild, makes up part of the moment in time which is now the Avro legend. A legend that is still very much alive in the hearts of the people who worked at Avro and in the hearts of their children who are old enough to remember those magical years. And for allowing me to share with you for a few moments some of the legacy and some of the pride of working at Avro and some of the sorrow, I would just like to say thank you.
the RCF, the government distributed the, the RFP to an aircraft industry who could only scratch their heads at the unbelievable requirements, suggested costs, and delivery dates. The seeds of the dream had been planted. Immediately, an emerging energy permeated the boardrooms of industry and began, began patronizing the government to share in this new enterprise. The winning response to the RFP had to be a competent organization having a knowledgeable management, the latest in modern equipment and techniques, an expandable skilled workforce, and especially employee loyalty, pride, and ambition to perfect the product, something that's missing today. A.B. Rowe had demonstrated these qualities when selected as the prime contractor. The dream was now a possibility. A.B. Rowe successfully recruited skills from all over the world to create the dream. A dream team was born and the dream team population expanded quickly interviewing industry after industry. Now, developing a new aircraft requires exceptional organizational skills necessary to address every bit of the airplane. Nothing can be left out. Yet an aircraft is made in three major categories, similar to the early concepts of manufacturing automobiles. In an automobile, you ordered a carriage or a body, an engine, and an interior. In an aircraft, you order an airframe, engines, and a payload, or an interior subject to the use of the aircraft for carrying passengers, cargo, or munitions. <coughs> the airframe. The dream team created the incomparable aerodynamic delta wing configuration, the RCA. Vision and 
subcontractor control, expediters, storerooms, and then we come to a thing called quality control. Everybody fought with quality control. They were responsible for tool standards, process inspection, scrap reject control, product acceptance, product sample test, inspection, inspection, Ultimately, all the green team components, parts, and documents were directed to Wavy Row for final check the records, final aircraft installation, checkout, and subsequent flight tests. Many more talents were necessary that had special skills, such as flight tests, sales and service, the legal department, public relations. The list just goes on and on and on. When the Arrow program was terminated, five different Arrow aircraft had accumulated almost 50, 70 flight hours. It was publicly apparent that the dream of an Arrow was realized. The dream was real. Many articles and stories, six books, have been published about the Arrow. A few of these publications have well-researched accuracies most have a plethora of questionable facts and conclusions. Some memorabilia, especially photography, and I must say that everything that we have today in the Arrow program is stolen from government holdings that you're overlooking it. Uh, most of the stuff that's around photography and some of the components can be acquired at a price. If anybody wants to explore these things, see me after the show. <laughs> the name Avro Canada and Avro Aircraft no longer exists. The rest is memories. A postscript. According to most pundits who proclaim Arrow expertise, the Arrow was terminated due to high costs, bad designs, poor manufacturing, inferior performance, mismanagement, and many other derogatory comments. I have to put that into a nice way tonight and say, what a crop of buffalo chips. <laughs> <laughs> Those of us who were there, members of the dream team, privy to facts about these condemnations, those who participated in the production of this years ahead of its time machine can readily refute these claims. <clears throat> claims by people who from hearsay conversations and first <coughs> documents endeavor to impress the public with their incomplete research and baseless opinions. <coughs> the Arrow was a financial burden. The Arrow Termination Program had cost Canadians, and these numbers are questionable, but generally considered to be reasonably accurate. The Arrow Termination Program had cost Canadians about $380 million. That included five flying and two ready-to-fly Arrows. Arrow had offered 100 Arrows, including Iroquois engines, weapons systems, and support services for $350 approximately three and a half million dollars each. And it was turned down for reasons I don't think anybody knows but those who are deceased. The arrow cancellation costs were in the order of 170 million dollars. The arrow was capable of speed Mach 2 plus and a 60,000 feet ceiling and it could intercept and inter uh, outperform any aircraft in the then arsenals of the major world powers. Now, after 40 years, the Arrow offered itself in many of these world theaters and is only truly, truly outclassed today by the U.S. Rockwell X-31 and the Russian Su-37. It is still, or would have been still, a good aircraft. 
story goes on that uh, someone mentioned earlier, I guess it was Jim, that uh, there may be an airplane flying around. Well, I had to put it one down here earlier today. The one that got away didn't. There's just no way we can find anything that resembles an airplane that could have gone away. It was absolutely, absolutely impossible. However, in the cancellation, there were major concerns that influenced, I believe, the decision to end the dream. There were NATO persuasions of missiles versus aircraft. There was industry's executive arrogance dealing with the government, and that exists today. There were many government leaderships in Ottawa being manipulated by the U.S. industry these are factual statements. There was lack of an available weapons system, although an acceptable system was being finalized in the drawing board. There was intense, and I mean intense, U.S. industry paranoia regarding the management of what was then the ABC or the American, British, Canadian sensitive classified documents and hardware. Instead of endeavoring to rectify these concerns, the government chose to shut down, which might be now, forever, Canada's collective dreams of a potential leadership of Canadian aerospace expertise in the international community. One series of plausible events resulting from the ROTMI, pardon <coughs> me, Many of us, Dream Team members, went to the U.S., NASA, and aerospace industries, and were in the vanguard of some incredible work in the Mercury and Gemini space test programs and the ultimate moon landing Apollo program. Also, many other APs 
home when we get out this morning, what we're going to have outside. We sit and we sweat and we wait until an aircraft touches down and comes in from Houston, Texas from the NASA Center. And off steps your next speaker, Brian Irvin. He's here tonight to speak on the people that left Avro and where they went.
we have a pleasure to have our draw for tonight. We were given, as you came in, tickets. If you would pull them out, please. There's a lot of tickets on the table there. You want to take the prizes? <laughs>